He's out there, coordinate off, don't go near it. It could, um, could be very problematic and could cause you some harm because of all of the, the witch's brew of rocket fuel which is on board any space shuttle. CNN's Alec Fraser is a um, veteran of the U.S. Navy, Navy captain, uh, has a lot of experience in defense matters, intelligence matters through his tour of duty. Uh, he joins us now uh, with some insights on a couple of aspects of this which we have to at least touch the base on, and that is terrorism. Alec? I think there are a couple of uh, things that people ought to know because anytime an incident like this happens, there's a concern that there was a terrorist threat and that somebody actually shot it down by a missile. There are two reasons that this could not happen by a missile intercept. Number one is the altitude. Most missiles cannot fly above 100,000 feet mainly because there's not enough air for the tail fins to be able to guide the missile. And number two is the shuttle was running at a Mach 6 rate, and Mach 3 is as fast as most intercepts can be done. Alex, uh, we, we probably should do our mathematics. 12,500 miles an hour, I believe, equates to faster than even Mach 6, but th the point is moot because it's way too fast. Right of your screen, by the way, I want to point out is the president's motorcade uh, on its way from Camp David. And I believe uh, they're driving in because of the bad weather there in Washington. I'm not positive of that, but that would probably explain why he's not in the helicopter. Alec, continue on your point there. Well, for those two reasons, this type of intercept could never happen. And there, are, there are reports that people saw commercial aircraft in the area of the, of the space shuttle. But you've got to remember there's an altitude difference there of 170,000 feet. And any type of intercept or any type of problem of a mid-air collision is just simply not possible. Yeah. So. Uh, we, we, we sort of have to touch the base. We have to bring it up just to knock it down, if nothing else, in this day and age, don't we? But that's right. And anything that's going that fast and that high is, is, is impossible to be considered as a, as a terrorist missile attack. And remember those concerns that we've had of, of airplanes, commercial airliners being shot down by shoulder-fired, infrared, heat-seeking missiles. Those only go to two or three miles high. And we're, we're talking about 200,000 feet here, so those are not a threat. So you'd be working with a radar-guided missile, a very complex, highly technical system that could intercept something that high or that fast. And again, 100,000 feet or Mach 3 is about as, as much as anybody can do. Okay, faster than anything out there. And I, 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 we should underscore that point, but as we say, given the, the environment in which we live, we've got to at least uh, express that to, to make people realize that it isn't possible and is not a likely scenario. And that might be something that is going through people's minds, right, Alec? Right, and it's just not possible. All right. Uh, we would like to underscore a couple of points for you. First of all, we are expecting uh, about 23 minutes from now uh, a briefing from the NASA Administrator, Sean O'Keefe, who, a um, little more than a year into his job, um, has quite a job ahead of him. Uh, he will be addressing reporters at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And we will, of course, bring that to you live. Um, it's very likely that there's not a lot uh, that they can offer, he can offer all of us in the way of technical information to give us a sense of what happened, except to tell you what you can clearly see um, on your screen right there, uh, that the shuttle disintegrated. Columbia, the oldest uh, shuttle in the um, orbiter fleet of four, uh, disintegrated over Texas. As we just told you, 12,500 miles an hour. Uh, I don't know what that equates to Mach, but it's... Uh, real fast and uh, 200,000 feet above the ground uh, disintegrated into those uh, multiple fireballs, five, six, maybe more of them, big ones, and rained down debris over an area extending beyond 120 miles from Interstate 45 in Texas all the way to the border. We suspect uh, as well as uh, parts of Louisiana, although we haven't heard from people in Louisiana, there's a piece of debris there. Uh, Alexandria, uh, excuse me, um, Anderson County, Texas. Stay away from it because uh, of the, the, the uh, toxic brew which is on board a shuttle could cause you great harm. It's also would be a violation of federal law to touch it. Been hoping to get some more interviews with the crew. We talked to the crew before they left and I'm wondering if we have another one of those ready to, in the gate, ready to go. All right, we're, we're gonna try to get that together. We're hoping to. Um, Mike Brooks, our law enforcement uh, expert, 
uh, has been on the phone with the FBI, and in this situation, even though we just talked about how remote the chance of terrorism is, the FBI is involved, isn't it, Mike? Yes, they are, Miles. I just got off the phone with the uh, Dallas office of the FBI with their spokesperson, Special Agent Laurie Bailey, and Special Agent Bailey told me that, uh, that they are, have set up a command post, and they are treating this right now as a, as a military aircraft down, and, uh, and their main responsibility right now, the FBI is assisting in containing any debris fields at all. Uh, they have uh, mobilized right now over 30 agents and support staff uh, and the, along with their evidence response team which is a, which is a team of highly trained professionals that will go out and contain the evidence and and process it and uh, work together with the military uh, to try to again piece everything back together again but there have been uh, different reports around the state around the Dallas Fort Worth area that uh, that there have been a num number of debris fields uh, debris that has been raining down over that particular area um, they right now also are fielding calls from local law enforcement and from citizens and and I want to again and stress and, and the FBI wants to again stress that if you do find something call your local law enforcement call your local fire department but don't get and go near it don't touch it as miles was saying the you know the, the toxic widgets brew if you will that's contained in a shuttle and, uh, and and just leave it where it lies and call local uh, the local authorities miles Mike Brooks uh, and let's just underscore the point one more time the FBI is involved but we need to state this as clearly as we can for viewers Terrorism is not really on the, the radar screen here. Not at all. No, they're, right now, they're not even talking about anything at all about terrorism when I was talking with the FBI. They don't think that the, the, the terrorism plays any role in this whatsoever. All right. The best we can hope right now is that the FBI and all the local authorities there are able to marshal their resources, and it's got to be extensive given the debris field. Keep people away from this, these pieces. Very much so. And in, uh, in the Dallas office of the FBI, they have uh, smaller offices outside in Texarkana and other small towns in and around Texas uh, they call resident agencies. And uh, they're also getting those people uh, in their office to uh, work and coordinate with the local law enforcement on trying to locate any debris that all that's found in some of the even remote locations in and around the state of Texas. Miles? All right, Mr. Brooks, Mike Brooks, uh, please stay in close contact, stay in touch with your sources for us, and keep us posted on what they know there, if you would. This past week um, was a difficult week for NASA before this happened. Uh, January 27th, the anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire. You recall that fire on the launch pad in 1967. Killed three uh, astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, um, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm forgetting the third astronaut right now. You'll, you'll forgive me. In any case, uh, it was also the anniversary of the Space Shuttle Challenger's explosion um, on January 28th. And it was on that occasion that Rick Husband, the commander of the Space Shuttle Columbia, radioed down some words to Mission Control uh, marking that moment. Well, things are going really great, Miles. We're having a great time up here. We had a great ride to orbit, and uh, all the activation of the experiments in the space lab went extremely well, and uh, we're really, uh, we've got our space legs and uh, up and running. Okay, that, that was not at all what I told you it was. That was a little piece of an interview I did with the crew on the Saturday after they launched, Rick Husband talking about um, their time in space, and it might be worth at some point replaying a, a healthier chunk of that. Um, we have um, isolated the moment where Mission Control first became aware that there was a problem, the, sort of the, the last message. Well, all right. We're going to try to get all this stuff together, and we will go to Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy? Thanks, Miles. Uh, let me just say uh, very quickly at the outset here how glad we are as your colleague that you're on the job this morning with your extensive uh, experience and background in this, uh, in this area on this terribly tragic day. With me, Miles, uh, in the studio here in Washington is Patty Davis, who covers aviation, has been talking to people at the Federal Aviation Administration, National Transportation Safety Board. Patty, what are they saying at this well, point? Judy, the FAA this? says that it has been in contact with NASA on this shuttle accident. The FAA and the NTSB say that investigators are on standby, ready to go to the crash site if there is, it can be a, a, a crash site. It looks like it's a very widely spread out site. If they're requested to go by NASA, now the National Transportation Safety Board, which is the agency that investigates air crashes, played a broad role, a spokesperson said, in the shuttle Challenger explosion. In the 1980s, the NTSB reconstructed parts of the shuttle for NASA and did a lot of the metallurgical work, looking at the composition of the metal 
debris from that accident. Now, aviation safety experts say what will be of critical importance in this accident, all the telemetry from the shuttle transmitted to mission control. The debris field expected, as I said, to be very, very wide since it broke up at some 200,000 feet in the air. And the FAA says that it did not have any contact with the shuttle at all. It was still very high in the air. Air traffic control would have made contact with the shuttle when it reached about 60,000 feet. A spokeswoman telling me that at that point, uh, air traffic control would have brought it into the airfield just like any other aircraft, moving aircraft out of the way. No reports from American pilots, Southwest or Northwest pilots, that they saw any of this unfold or anything unusual. Usual. Normally they would report such activity uh, to their bases and also to the Federal Aviation Administration, but certainly a, an unfolding situation and we may hear more. And Patty, I just want to, you know, while you're here, clarify. I know Miles has been talking about this all morning. There have been witnesses who saw commercial, what appeared to be commercial jetliners in the area. Just to be very clear, commercial aircraft in this, in, you know, all over the world fly at a much lower altitude than where the shuttle was Right, was we're talking a commercial aircraft being like 30, 35,000 feet in the right. air. The shuttle at 200,000 feet. There's no way they could have come in contact with each other. The FAA is saying what, what their the, the value. Except at the very last. At the uh, very last very stage closest as it's landing. Entry point. Right, right. 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 Uh, the FAA is saying uh, the value of perhaps an aircraft being in the area would be that perhaps a pilot may have seen something. Uh, but we haven't had any reports at this point of a pilot saying, yes, I saw it, and here's what I saw. How much uh, at this point, n normally there wouldn't be much uh, contact, would there be between NASA and the Federal Aviation Administration? I mean, clearly they have to coordinate to some extent because when the shuttle's coming down, they don't want aircraft in the area. Exactly. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration puts TFRs or temporary flight restrictions in into place around the airfield, around the path where the shuttle would be coming in. And as I said, FAA is taking over air traffic control wise when that plane is coming in, when that shuttle is coming in to land because it's coming into an airfield. And that's the FAA's job is to get the shuttle down. But it just did not get to the point where our traffic had stepped in. So just to summarize again, Patty, what is it that officials uh, both at the FAA and uh, I guess in particular now the National Transportation Safety Board will be doing? What is their job right now? Well, they're waiting to get a request from NASA. They don't know. They all have crash investigators. They all have experts in crashes. Uh, they would be providing a support role, it looks like at this point, since this is a not a commercial uh, space uh, vehicle. This is a, a U.S. Uh, government one. So NASA would most likely take the lead role in this. These, all these agencies would be supporting, bringing their experts in, safety experts saying that it's important that the NTSB with its experts get involved because they have expertise in this area. That's right. All right, Patty Davis, thanks very much. And Miles, as I come back to you, uh, I've been looking at the news wires, as, uh, as I know you have, uh, seeing, reading reports of people who live in Arkansas and Louisiana uh, saying that they saw an explosion in the air. If you can help, uh, you know, help everyone understand a little bit better about the trajectory and where people in the United States might have first seen this happen and where it might have happened, it might not have been over Texas. Hard to say, uh, Judy, except we do know the point at, at which they lost communication. Obviously, uh, mission control in Houston is in constant communication with that space shuttle from the moment of launch really all the way down to landing. It's not like the old days where you had those blackout periods in the Gemini and Apollo missions when they didn't hear from them for some time and then they come back through the after the chutes open and everybody would breathe a sigh of relief. It's constant communication, so they can pinpoint the exact moment, and we're told it was right about 9 a.m. Eastern time, and we can pinpoint that location as being there right over kind of north central Texas, right around Dallas. As a matter of fact, that WFAA affiliate tape that we've been showing you, you actually see uh, what starts out as appearan the appearance of a normal space shuttle uh, the comet-like streak, as you see it there, one fireball with one tail, and you almost w witness the whole thing happening. You see the kind of the, 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 the uh, tail sort of it acts in a strange way, and then boom, all of a sudden you see, you see those small pieces right behind there. If you can put it in the telestrator, I could help out a little bit. But, um, and then, uh, then wait and watch. Okay, now uh, additional pieces come off there. So you're almost seeing it right that moment over uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. And that is really a, as good a piece of evidence as we have right now. Juxtapose that with the time frame, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. So
So, My Miles, yeah. I just uh, I just want to say what what the Associated Press anyway is reporting is the police uh, in near Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, people, uh, police in uh, Arkansas, the only town I see quoted is Stamps, Arkansas, I'm not sure where that is, geographically saying many people calling authorities saying they saw explosions in the sky, one man saying I think we're being attacked. Uh, it's pretty clear there's some connection here. Yes, clearly. I mean, traveling west to east, that all fits uh, with what we're seeing. And at that altitude, on a clear morning, uh, a big wide swath of the, the ground would have uh, the opportunity to see this, even if debris didn't actually rain down in that particular area. You'd be able to see it for many, many miles uh, at that altitude. Um, I recall uh, after the uh, Challenger incident, I was in Tampa, Florida. Now the Challenger blew up right about in the same altitude, 150, 200,000 feet. Uh, we could see the cloud, the remnants of the Challenger from Tampa, 150 miles away. So that gives you a sense of uh, the clear view uh, vision that people might have, and that would drive with all those reports uh, uh, that we're seeing. Uh, we have uh, with us from Dallas, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, uh, Senator from Texas. Uh, Senator Hutchinson, good to have you with us. Thank you, Miles, thank you. Tell us uh, what you, have you had any direct contact with the search and rescue effort at all? Tell us what you, what you know about efforts to preserve the debris and keep people away from it. Well, I've talked to the uh, deputy administrator at NASA just to first of all offer my office if they needed to get here quickly because I'm sure they are going to have search and rescue teams all over north and east Texas. They're, they know that they have debris found in Nacogdoches and uh, certainly near Dallas. Uh, so I've talked to them and they are just devastated by this of course and uh, we want to be helpful in every way that we can to try to get to the mod bottom of this. Um, I am on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee in the Senate. I'm sure that we will have hearings to talk about what went wrong and just try to learn from this tragic accident uh, so that we will know what to expect in the future and try to make safety a first priority. Senator. Um Inevitably, uh, in the wake of all this, there will be discussion about the merits of putting people in, in harm's way in this manner, of taking the risk. Is it worth it? Well, I, I think clearly any time we are pushing the envelope in research and technology, uh, there are going to be tragedies. We have had uh, the terrible Challenger tragedy before this. Uh, I would never want America to walk away from being in the forefront of uh, the, the research. It, it has been wonderful for our country, but I do think we have to appreciate the test pilots who are willing to become astronauts because they are taking a huge risk and, and they know they are and they're willing to do it uh, to keep America in the forefront of the space research, which has been so valuable to our country. So I guess then, you know, it, it, this could be one of those um, forks in the road when it comes to um, your role and Congress's role. One fork uh, says, let's, let's end manned spaceflight. The other fork would be, maybe it's time to start thinking about a, a new generation of vehicles which can carry humans to the final frontier. Well, I think the new generation, the new mission uh, of NASA is the way to go. I would never step back from America's preeminence in space. Uh, I think the next missions are going to be medically related, and uh, certainly uh, we want to know what is out there. Just look at what the satellite technology has brought to our country in security. It's making all the difference in in our war, the predators, and the ability to communicate through uh, satellites. All of this happened because we have been willing to push that envelope and, and be first in space and, and make sure that we learn the technology that, that keeps us in the forefront. So walking away from space research would never be uh, an option. What we have to do is make sure that we have a clear mission that we fully fund NASA so that we have safety as a priority and we need to appreciate these wonderful test pilots who are doing so much for our country. Their mission is every bit as important as our national security and national defense. 
Well, that's that's an amen moment. We'll we'll leave it at that. Senator Kay well, thank you. Bailey Hutchinson of Texas, uh, we wish you well uh, in the near term, helping out with this search and rescue operation, and also in the long term as you deal with the investigation and the discussion which will follow in the months to come. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson from Dallas. Um, we have been getting some emails all morning from people who saw various things, some of them uh, with uh, still photographs. Um, let's bring in uh, one of those witnesses. Um, Waylon, Waylon Wagner from Henderson, Texas is with us now. Uh, Mr. Wagner, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, I can. All right, if we could uh, bring up your still image, which is on the um, computer in the control room there. Uh, we can take a look at the still image you captured. Tell me uh, what you saw, heard, how you came to be outside with a camera. Well, uh, it was about 8 o'clock this morning, and uh, I went outside on my patio just to have my coffee, like I normally do. And our house faces basically the south. And I was looking out toward kind of the northwest, and it was coming over our tree line. And it was just a very thin vapor line at that time. And I thought, wow, you know, what a beautiful meteor, uh, you know. And we so, did wait, not... Mr. H you did not know that it was the shuttle necessarily? You just no, happened? sir. Okay. We had gone out to eat last night, and we didn't know anything about the shuttle reentering today. I see. Okay, go ahead. So I, I was standing there, you know, and it just got bigger, and you could see more smoke coming off of it. And about that time, I hollered at my wife, and I said, come out here and look at this meteor, you know. And... Uh, she ran out there and she said, let me go get my camera. So she ran back in and got her camera and took these pictures. Now, these pictures here are, you know, it might have been a minute or so after that. And these were more in the southeast when these pictures were taken. And then she's actually got some pictures of them, of the vapor trail as they went in behind the tree. Do you, um, did you hear anything or was it so far away that you couldn't? Do what? Did you hear anything unusual, or was it so far away you couldn't hear anything unusual? No. Uh, at this time, after we had taken the pictures and everything, we hurried back into the house, and we had the weather channel on. And we thought, well, if it's a meteor, maybe they'll show something. And then the newscaster that was on uh, had come on and read us the deal about the shuttle. Well, then we went immediately to your station, and then we saw it. And then just maybe a minute or a minute and a half the house started rumbling really and we're going oh no wow you know wow. and uh so the, the rumble sort of occurred sometime thereafter yes sir we had already come back in the house and was watching the tv and then we realized what it was was the shuttle had re-entered and everything and uh we stepped outside again and just listened to it it was kind of like a oh a big thundering noise like a thundercloud would cause in the distance and it just kept on and on and on and we just kind of sat back down here at the tv and looked at each other you know and just all that it, so it, it might have just taken that much time for the sound to reach you in other words well yeah it was probably at least a minute you yeah. know minute yeah. to a minute and a half and then we started hearing the sound of it all right, uh, we're going to leave it at that. Uh, Waylon Wagner, Henderson, Texas, thank you for sending that image, which shows, uh, to my way of counting, uh, one, two, three, four, f at least five distinct big pieces of the Space Shuttle Columbia at that moment in time over Henderson, Texas. CNN's Robert Novak uh, sat down with uh, the new NASA Administrator, Sean O'Keefe, uh, just last week, had a lengthy interview with him, talked a lot about... Um, where he was headed. And uh, one of the things that was um, uppermost on Sean O'Keefe's mind has been the announcement just now, a little more than a week old, of a new educator mission specialist program. Uh, really sort of the fulfillment of the teacher in space mission uh, of Krista McAuliffe, Space Shuttle Challenger, 17 years ago. NASA finally getting to the stage where it was ready to begin uh, thinking about flying teachers once again. Barbara Morgan, Krista McAuliffe's understudy, due to fly, was due to fly at the end of this year, November. And uh, additional teachers were encouraged to apply uh, to fly in subsequent missions about one a year for the foreseeable future. Um, it was a time when, um, at least last week, when Bob Novak sat down with Sean O'Keefe, there was a lot of talk about bringing civilians into space. Um, what, else did, what else did he have to say, Bob? Miles, uh, I had mentioned to uh, uh, Administrator O'Keefe that uh, 
uh, the astronauts used to be household words, and uh, people really didn't know the the astronauts now. And uh, uh, I wondered if the lack of public interest and support in the, in the space program uh, was a problem of not knowing the astronauts and whether they should get to uh, know them better. He mentioned then Barbara Morgan, and he also went on to say this, and this has a, this is a. Uh, has a poignant uh, sound now as we listen to it. Let's listen to what the uh, Administrator O'Keefe said. We we'll also need to get to know a lot more about, again, guys like Ken Bowersox or Rick Husband, the guy who is the commander of the current expedition that's uh, underway right now. Uh, those, are the, those are the kinds of folks that, that we, I think, ought to admire, look up to, and realize the extraordinary capabilities they have and the sacrifice that they make each and every day on our behalf as explorers. It really is an extraordinary group of people. Of course, we uh, now get to know these people much better with this uh, tragedy, Miles. And uh, the administ administrator O'Keefe, who is not a space expert at all, he was brought in there because he's a great numbers cruncher, he's a good management man, former secretary of the Navy, he was deputy man at the Office of Management and Budget, trying to make do with kind of short rations for NASA, trying to increase public support. Now he's got even a bigger task, and that is to explain to Congress and indeed to the nation uh, what happened today. And uh, there will undoubtedly be people, who, naysayers will say, uh, man space is too uh, risky, but as Senator Hutchinson said, and I'm sure I know that uh, as Sean O'Keefe will say that it is essential that we continue the manned space program. CNN's Bob Novak, who um, had the last uh, lengthy interview with uh, Sean O'Keefe before um, we hear from him today. Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, that's right about now, is when we expect to hear from him. We will bring it to you the moment it begins, but uh, let's take an opportunity to recap. As we take a look at uh, pictures uh, captured by our affiliate WFAA, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Local Time, what you're seeing are the final moments of the Space Shuttle Columbia as it broke up into several pieces, at least five big ones that we are able to count, disintegrated at an altitude of 200,000 feet, traveling 12,500 12, miles an hour, some 15 or 16 minutes prior to its anticipated landing at the Kennedy Space Center crew of seven aboard had conducted a 16-day science mission, traveled six and a half million miles in the course of that, and had, by most accounts, a, a relatively flawless mission. Uh, the crew, led by Commander uh, Rick Husband, uh, featured uh, Mark Brown, Laura Clark, Kaplana Chala, Willie McCool, the pilot, uh, Mike Anderson, and Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli to fly in space. Uh, featured a 16-day science mission where they conducted um, in excess of 80 separate experiments on themselves, on rodents, uh, on all kinds of things, physical sciences, trying to learn more about how microgravity affects uh, human beings as well as other phenomena. Uh, by all accounts, it was a successful scientific run. And then, inexplicably, at 9 a.m. Eastern, just about that time that tape was shot, we lost a communication. Now, let me just tell you how a shuttle, oh, this is a little different than I, I'm sorry, this anticipated something else. It was coming in this way uh, across uh, Texas, right about this point is where the breakup occurred. Uh, should have continued down right along the rim of the um, Gulf Coast there through the panhandle of Florida and down into um, the Orlando area and um, make a steep right turn to runway 33 at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Um, that was the altitude and speed at the time of the breakup. Tremendous forces on a shuttle. The whole process of a deorbit burn begins in the Indian Ocean when they fire rockets, which slow the shuttle down just enough for it to begin falling out of orbit. The shuttle essentially is in a constant free fall around the planet at 17,500 miles an hour, sort of the perfect balance between its speed and the forces of gravity slows it down just enough to begin that precipitous drop. It begins a series of broad S-turns to dissipate heat, or to trade, um, I should say, speed for heat. It's covered with thermal insulating tiles, which are designed to protect the aluminum frame of the shuttle from that tremendous heat, which can exceed 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Those tiles can, are a very fragile thing, which uh, have caused a lot of maintenance headaches over the years for NASA as it tries to keep the space shuttle fleet uh, flying. Now, uh, into its uh, 22nd year. Uh, all right, we have CNN's Gary Tuckman uh, on the scene at the Kennedy Space Center, right near where that press conference 
with the NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe is set to begin. Uh, Gary, um, I, I know you're just kind of hitting the, hitting the ground running there, but if you can give me a sense of what the scene is like. Miles, as you might expect, it's a very difficult, sad, and confusing time for the employees and visitors here at the Kennedy Space Center. I just spent some time about 30 minutes ago at the Visitor Center where tourists come, and Saturday's a very busy tourist day here at the Space Center. And there's a huge flagpole with the American flag flying at half staff at the Visitor Center. And I saw a family, a husband, wife, and their two children stepping out of their car to go on the tour of the Kennedy Space Center. And there were a lot of people running around in the flag and half staff. And the woman looked at me and saw I was with CNN and said, what's going on here? She had no idea what had happened. I quietly informed her what had happened, and she burst into tears. And that gives you an idea of what people are going through here. There are flags at half staff throughout the complex. There's a sign, and you've probably seen this, Miles, when you've been at the Cape, when you drive in, and it tells you how many days it is until the next launch, how many days it is until the next landing. And it says zero days until the next space shuttle landing. And it is a very eerie case of deja vu for a lot of us. I was here in 1986 at that point. I know you, Miles, worked in Tampa for a local station. I worked in West Palm Beach, and I was here that day after the Challenger exploded. And it's the very same terrifying, terrible feeling here of deja vu almost two decades later, exact same week of the year, first day of February today, January 28th. 17 years ago, but it's a very sad day here at the Kennedy Space Center. Miles. Gary Tuckman, thank you very much. As we look at this picture, um, which I believe came down a little while ago, uh, the flag at half staff there beside the countdown clock at the Kennedy Space Center. In the distance, you see launch pad 39A, which is exactly the point at which Columbia left the planet 16 days ago. Um, about um, three miles from where that flag lies, um, sort of to the back of the camera is the shuttle landing facility where it should have arrived uh, 9 16 a.m. this morning but as we have been telling you uh, that did not happen it disintegrated uh, shortly after losing communication with mission control over the state of Texas somewhat ironically uh, disintegrated into several pieces at high altitude and high speed raining down debris over a huge huge swath of Texas and into Louisiana and there you see Half staff at the White House, live pictures there. Uh, this one from the North Lawn as we see uh, the nation in the earliest stages of beginning to mourn uh, a brave crew of people who understood these risks and yet willingly, gladly embraced them. Let's uh, send it over to Heidi Collins. We'll get another update for you. We want to let you know that the minute that Sean O'Keefe begins talking, we'll bring it to you. Yes, we will, Miles. We want to let uh, everybody know we're going to recap the details now of the tragic ending of the Space Shuttle Columbia mission and what a tragedy it is. Here's what we know. NASA lost communication with Columbia just moments before it was scheduled to touch down in Florida at 916 Eastern this morning. Officials say they were given no indication of trouble. Meanwhile, television images captured the craft separating into pieces as it streaked across the Texas sky. An investigation began almost immediately to find out what happened. An official in Washington says an act of terrorism was considered highly unlikely. Spectators who went to Kennedy Space Center to see the shuttle landing were left waiting. We're shocked. We're we, at a loss for words. We don't know what to think. We feel so sad and sorry for the families of people that have been lost. Just hope uh, they're with God. Search and rescue teams fanned out across south central Texas looking for debris from the spacecraft. Officials warned people to stay away from anything that might look like a piece of potentially hazardous wreckage. Among the seven Columbia crew members, Commander Rick Husband was at the helm along with pilot William McCool. Colonel Ilan Ramon, Israel's first man in space. Also, payload commander Michael Anderson, mission specialists David Brown, Kalpana Chawla, and Dr. Laurel Clark. Miles, we're going to send it back over to you. All right, thank you very much, Heidi Collins, for um, offering a, a good recap for those of you who might just be joining us about uh, what has turned out to be a tragic day, February 1st, 2003, the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Um, we are expecting a news conference from the NASA Administrator, Sean O'Keefe, to talk about the picture you see on your screen right now, which is that s uh, stream of multiple fireballs, a couple explosions there. You see the puffs of smoke coming out of it as Columbia 
streaked across Texas about 9 a.m. Eastern this morning, uh, losing communication with Mission Control right about the same time, doing exactly what you're seeing here, which is breaking up, in-flight breakup. And that is all we can tell you about what happened because uh, we don't have a lot of uh, information in the early stages of things like this, of course. And uh, of most current concern right now to officials is to secure the debris, which has rained down on a huge, huge swath of the United States from Texas into Louisiana, um, hundreds of miles uh, of debris. And that debris with its toxic brew associated with it is to be avoided at all costs. Please let authorities know if you know of some, but please, by all means, don't touch it. You could hurt yourself badly, and we don't want that to happen on top of everything else that has happened today. Let's uh, bring in Barbara Starr, uh, our Pentagon correspondent, to see uh, what, if anything, the Pentagon is aware of on this story. Barbara? Miles, we can tell you now that U.S. military forces from Fort Hood, Texas, are moving into position. Fort Hood, Texas, just announcing that it has launched helicopters, four helicopters now in the air, participating in what they are calling a search and rescue mission. But of course, it is really search and recovery of the debris and the crew of Columbia. They tell us that this task force will be comprised of helicopters from sev several military elements at Fort Hood, Texas. As we said, four helicopters now in the air. They will also be accompanied by military police from the 89th Military Police Brigade at Fort Hood. We are told as they locate debris, military police will now move in and secure those debris sites. Fort Hood is also telling us this will be a 24-7 operation that they will use their Black Hawk helicopters during the daylight hours to search for debris. And when, once darkness falls, they will move in with what are called Kiowa Warrior helicopters. These are helicopters, of course, with night vision capability and night vision sensors. Again, the military police will move in to secure the debris sites until the debris can be removed in a safe manner. We are also told that, coincidentally, this was a drill weekend for the Texas National Guard, that they have additional helicopters and personnel that are on standby, even a C-130 aircraft, and that they will move in once the order comes down. But so far, it is the elements from Fort Hood, Texas, and of course, quite coincidentally, Fort Hood, this very weekend, was getting organized to begin its deployment to the Persian Gulf for possible military operations against Iraq. Miles? So, Barbara, uh, the, key, the key point here is to try to preserve all this debris. And uh, do you get the sense that there will be enough forces marshaled to this effort? Yes, there, you know, Fort Hood, Texas, to be uh, quite clear, is a huge military installation in Texas, 42,000 personnel. And of course, the Texas National Guard has a lot of assets at its disposal, troops, vehicles, uh, airborne assets. So w between the governor of Texas activating any National Guard elements down there on a state level and any requests that NASA may make to the Pentagon here today, there should be plenty of capability to move into these various sites very quickly, secure them, and recover that debris. All right, Miles. Barbara Starr, uh, thank you very much, and stay close, please. Um, I told you a little while ago that this was a tough week for NASA already. January 27th, 1967, the Apollo 1 fire. Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee, my apologies, I couldn't remember Chaffee's name a little while ago, it's been a long morning, uh, died in that fire. January 28th, 1986, the Challenger disaster, uh, it exploding 70 some odd seconds after uh, liftoff. On that uh, anniversary of the 28th, the commander of the Columbia mission, Rick Husband, radioed down some words of remembrance. Okay, well, then we've got uh, an announcement that we'd like to make on behalf of the SS-107 crew. And it goes like this. It is the day that we remember and honor the crews of Apollo 1 and Challenger. They made the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives and service to their country and for all mankind. Their dedication and devotion to the exploration of space was an inspiration to each of us and still motivates people around the world to achieve great things in service to others. As we orbit the Earth, we will join the entire NASA family for a moment of silence in their memory. Our thoughts and prayers go to their families as well. Rick Husband, the commander of the Space Shuttle Columbia,
on January 28, 2003, commemorating the loss of Apollo 1 and Challenger, the ultimate sacrifice, as he put it. Jerry Lininger, a uh, shuttle veteran, a uh, man who spent a good deal of time aboard Mir, joining us now. It's hard to listen to those words, isn't it, Jerry? Yeah, very hard. Uh, I think every astronaut feels the same way, though. You know, there's a lot of people that have gone before us, uh, and the people have the courage to do the things that they're did. Uh, they know the danger, and uh, we're all proud of them. What, um, you know, the, the risks are so well known to the astronauts and their families, and yet um, many Americans really don't have a sense of it, do they? You, I know you talk to people all the time. Uh, do you get the sense uh, that people had this feeling that it was almost a routine type of operation. I think they do, Miles, and, and especially the re-entry. I think the, the liftoff people realize, wow, look at the power. They know it's a dangerous operation, but the re-entry, very dynamic. You're right on the edge of the envelope. You're bouncing hard, fireball around you. Uh, any astronaut, any person that's ever been through that experience knows that you are very close to disaster, and it's just the nature of what we do out in space. Well, what you're unleashing is this tremendous potential energy, uh, and that clearly is the focus. It gets a lot of people's attention, including even the layman would understand that that is a difficult thing. Let's talk about reentry, though, for a moment. A time, as you say, when perhaps uh, our guard is let down a little bit. It nevertheless, uh, when you're going from 17,500 miles an hour over the Indian Ocean to uh, zero at the end of the runway, uh, there's a lot of things happening in between, aren't there? A lot of things happening. Shuttle is at the point of the problem today uh, is under computer control and very fine computer control and you sort of rock the shuttle back and forth as you come down um, during re-entry and that sort of dissipates some of the heat, lets some of the stress off. Um, but it's a very dynamic process, all starting with the shuttle actually going upside down and backwards, firing the engines as you mentioned halfway around the world then getting wings level and then starting to hit some of the atmosphere and as you get lower and lower you hit more and more atmosphere and even though the speed is decreasing uh, you're hitting you know a wall essentially and you're diving down into it and it really heats up it's um, give us a sense of what that ride is like as you, you could do these big broad s turns it's a very severe maneuver isn't it uh, the maneuver is not so severe it's just the whole shuttle uh, I remember my first flight, the commander who very experienced, Dick Richards, uh, he, he, as we're coming down, bouncing around, his, he turns around and looks at me and his eyes are this big and just <laughs> says, wow, Jerry, isn't this, you know, wild ride. And here's an experienced uh, naval aviator off aircraft carriers all his life. So I think anyone, again, that experiences that, it is just one very dynamic ride. I said it sounded like a locomotive train going to run me down, you know, right behind me. And again, my first flight, I sort of looked over my shoulder to make sure it wasn't a train. And that's the normal reentry. So, um, you know, if anything goes a little bit wrong, uh, it can be tragic. And, you know, that's what happened today. Well, and, and give us a sense, because while you're inside that uh, flight deck and you're looking outside, you're seeing very c conclusive evidence of the amount of heat which envelops a space shuttle. It is all around you. Uh, you look out, actually the back window, you could see it too, and it's, it's sort of a collapsing, um, kind of a northern lights look. Everything very fluid, plasma moving around, and it is just, you know, orange, red, big fireball all around you. Um, so, you know, obviously when things did not go well and once one piece comes off uh, and you lose control, there's a lot of dynamic pressure, a lot of heat. And that's what you saw in all the films that you're looking at with the different segments coming off, heating up, and uh, multiple explosions, if you will. That's just debris going through uh, a heat tunnel. Now, and the way that uh, the, the orbiter's um, airframe is protected, it is, after all, made of aluminum, which would certainly melt in, the, in that, if it encountered that level of heat. The way it is done is with um, lots of blankets, thermal blankets, but uh, more importantly, especially on the bottom side, those black tiles which are designed, um, they're ceramic, uh, they're designed to absorb and shed the heat and protect the shuttle. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a fragile system in a sense, isn't it? 
It is, Miles. If you ever felt one of those tiles, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. It kind of feels like a piece of uh, styrofoam. It is that light. Uh, but you put a blowtorch on one end and you put your hand on the other side and you don't feel the heat. So, you know, the engineers came up with an incredible product there. Uh, and again, we don't know exactly what happened. All I can tell you, though, is the, the belly of the shuttle is well protected. But if you get in the wrong orientation at any moment during that reentry, uh, you are not protected on all sides. And so, um, you know, once you start coming apart, there's, there's nothing you can do. So what's your, a possibility then to look at would be if somehow the, the shuttle was not in the uh, perfect ideal orientation for some reason. That obviously would be high on the list of things that uh, investigators would probe. I'm sure they'll, they'll look very closely at that. They'll also look at some uh, better film. Uh, hopefully we had some telescopes pointing that way. Usually you follow the shuttle in. You might be able to see that initial moment where things uh, you know, came apart. I think software, some of the control systems, guidance and control systems may have failed and get you in slightly the wrong orientation. The other thing you mentioned during liftoff, a piece of debris possibly hitting the shuttle, if you have a spot that's exposed to that extreme heat and it melts through the shell and then hits a control surface, uh, you can get in trouble very quickly. Um, all those things will be looked at very hard, I'm sure. Try to put the debris field together, try to look for clues and evidence to to make sure it never happens again. And I, you know, I guarantee uh, the astronauts on board want us to keep pressing this thing and to keep going back to space and to, uh, to make the improvements and not make their sacrifice uh, something that's in vain. So I'm sure they want us to put the pieces together, figure out what went wrong and press on. Let's, uh, I, we should remind our viewers that we're uh, 20 minutes past the time uh, appointed for Sean O'Keefe to speak. Uh, we do expect a statement from the NASA Administrator from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida where he was to be to welcome back the crew uh, any minute now. We will bring it to you the moment it begins. Looking over my shoulder, still not there yet. Jerry, um, as we uh, get into um, this uh, scenario of something um, falling off during ascent, we want to be careful because it is so early and um, it, it, I, I hate to get too far down the road of speculation, but it, it is common knowledge that there was a piece that fell off that external tank, struck some portion of the, um, let's go, I'll tell you what, we're going to go to the press conference right now. Let's go to the Kennedy Space Center live now via NASA TV. About STS-107. We will have no questions today, just a few brief remarks. Uh, as indicated uh, Earlier, we'll make a statement uh, today and then at this point and a little later this afternoon at about 3 o'clock um, Eastern Time, there'll be a full technical briefing conducted from the Johnson Space Center. Uh, so at this point, we're just going to give you the, the, the circumstances we understand them leading up to this particular tragedy today. This is indeed a tragic day for the NASA family for the families of the astronauts who flew on STS-107, and likewise tragic for the nation. Immediately upon indication of a loss of communications on STS-107, uh, at a little after 9 a.m. this morning, we began our contingency plan to preserve all the information relative to the flight activities. I immediately advised the President uh, and the Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Tom Ridge, uh, at the point after landing was due to have occurred at 916, spoke to them very briefly thereafter uh, to advise that we had lost contact with the shuttle orbiter Columbia and STS-107 crew. They offered, the President specifically offered full and immediate support uh, to determine what the appropriate steps were thereafter to be taken. Uh, we then spent the next hour and a half working through the detail and information of what we have received. Uh, and uh, uh, Bill Reedy will walk you through the specifics of those operational and technical issues here in just a moment. Thereafter, we have met with the family members of the astronauts who uh, we're here at Kennedy Space Center and are soon to be departing to back to Johnston, to Houston. Uh, the President has called and spoken to them to express uh, our deepest national regrets. We have assured them that we will begin the process immediately. 
uh, to recover their loved ones and understand the cause of this tragedy. At this time, we have no indication that the mishap was caused by anything or anyone on the ground. We've assembled a mishap investigation team that immediately was assembled uh, upon the point of past the stage in which the orbiter was to have landed here at Kennedy Space Center uh, a little after 9.30, and that team in turn uh, is coordinating on a regular basis on all the facts that are pertaining to this from the Johnson Space Center and a rapid response team from here at the Kennedy Space Center as well as participants from the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. In addition to these internal efforts, we have also appointed a mishap investigation board, an external group uh, of people who are independent from NASA, who will immediately be charged with the opportunity to look at all the information that was uh, immediately uh, locked down right after uh, our f uh, absence of communications. Each of these individuals are safety and mission assurance related officials in other federal departments of the federal government, uh, from the Air Force, from the Navy, from the Department of Transportation, and across the federal expanse. The investigation team will also be chaired by an individual contacted uh, to serve who is external to the federal uh, agencies. Uh, and we'll have the opportunity to coordinate all the information again from an external view. So we'll be conducting both the internal activity uh, as well as a external review immediately to ascertain the causes and uh, circumstances under which this tragedy occurred. We pulled together all the federal agencies and local governments as well. Uh, in discussion several times this morning with Secretary Tom Ridge, uh, the effort is heavily underway to coordinate uh, an understanding of uh, exactly where uh, the orbiter uh, path had taken it from West Texas uh, towards uh, the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. Uh, and to make sure that the material on the ground is secured uh, so that the investigation can begin uh, promptly. We would urge anyone who believes they have discovered or found any material to stay away from it and to please contact local officials, the local first responder groups for emergency services and so forth uh, have been authorized and directed by Secretary Tom Ridge to assist in all manner. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is coordinating that effort on be part of the Department of Homeland Security. I was here this morning with the families of the astronauts and their friends. It started out as a pretty happy morning awaiting the landing of STS-107. And we had highly anticipated their return because we couldn't wait to congratulate them for their extraordinary performance and their excellent efforts on the science mission on this very important flight. They dedicated their lives to pushing the scientific challenges for all of us here on Earth. And they dedicated themselves to that objective and did it with a happy heart, willingly, and with great enthusiasm. The loss of this Valiant crew is something we will never be able to get over, and certainly the families of all of them, we have assured we will do everything, everything we can possibly do to guarantee that they work their way through this horrific tragedy. We ask the members of the media to honor that too. Please respect their privacy, and please understand the tragedy that they are going through at this time. We will help the media assure that be the case as well. We trust that the prayers of the nation will be with them and with their families. And again, a more courageous group of people you could not have hoped to know than the families of these crew members, and an extraordinary, extraordinary group of astronauts who gave their lives and did it in a way that they knew exactly the risk, but never, in a, ever, do we ever want to see a circumstance where something like this could ever happen. And we diligently dedicate ourselves every single day to assuring these things don't occur. And when they do, we have to act responsibly, accountably, and that's exactly what we will do. To give you more of the operational detail 
of what has occurred here uh, uh, since 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, the associate administrator for space flight, a former astronaut, retired captain of the United States Navy, former test flight pilot, uh, test of flight pilot uh, Bill Reedy, uh, who has commanded uh, two separate missions uh, previously and uh, as an astronaut and is now, uh, again, our associate administrator for space flight and has worked with me all morning along with all of us here at Kennedy Space Center uh, to work through the details of, uh, of the events as we know them and to present to you the facts that we understand them. Again, the technical details that are being worked very diligently now will be covered again at 3 p.m. this afternoon out of the Johnson Space Center. With that, let me turn it over to Captain Bill Reedy. a truly difficult day for all of us. Uh, many of us were standing alongside the runway waiting to celebrate their triumphant return after a 16-day science mission. I think you could tell from the downlink that they loved what they were doing and they thought what they were doing was extremely important, pushing back those boundaries in uh, science. At 9 o'clock, we heard that they had lost data from the spacecraft and it appears that that was at about 200,000 feet, about Mach 18. The loss of data was somewhere over north central Texas. And at the planned landing time of 916, we initiated our contingency action plan called the Rescue Coordination Center and initiated a search and rescue effort. Sadly, I think from the video that's available, does not appear that there were any survivors. We have currently impounded all the data, including all the pre-flight certification of flight readiness for STS-107. And at this point, I'd have to say it's too early to speculate about the exact cause. Obviously, we're looking at all the data that we have available. Those people that have videos, those people that have still pictures, uh, we'll urge you to contact NASA so that we can coordinate those things that might be available. And to reiterate what the administrator said, those people that may find debris, do not touch it, do not move it. Contact your local authorities, have them impound it and secure the area so that our technical specialists will be able to piece together uh, the puzzle so that we can resolve what happened. Our immediate focus is on the crew families, and we spent some time with them. The president called. I'd have to say the families are bearing up with uh, an incredible amount of dignity considering their loss. We all grieve for them. We all pray with them for the crew. But one thing came across loud and clear when visiting with them is they knew that the crew was absolutely dedicated to the mission that they were performing. And I think you could see that in the video downlink. They believed in what they were doing. And in the conversations with the crew and their families, they said that we must find what happened and fix it and move on. And we can't let their sacrifice be in vain. Today was a very stark reminder that this is a very risky endeavor, pushing back the frontiers in outer space and after 113 flights, unfortunately, people have a tendency to look at it as something that is more or less routine. Well, I can assure you it is not. Each and every time I flew, each and every time my colleagues flew, we treated that with the respect that it deserved from a professional standpoint. And I have to say that as the one responsible for shuttle and station within the NASA, that I know that the people of NASA did everything possible 
preparing for this flight to make it as perfect as possible. My promise to the crew and to the crew families is that the investigation that we have just launched will find the cause, will fix it, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Again, we know you all have questions, and we will have a news briefing at 3 o'clock, and we'll give you that opportunity at that time. Thank you. We just heard uh, finally there from Lisa Malone, public affairs officer with the uh, Kennedy Space Center in, at NASA. Uh, she was preceded uh, by Bill Reedy, the Associated Administrator for Human Spaceflight, uh, who was himself preceded by the Administrator of NASA, Sean O'Keefe, uh, telling us uh, where the investigation is headed and uh, offering some reminders of the risks uh, involved in all of this. Um, an independent um, investigative team is already being assembled, which will look at this entire thing outside um, the federal government with some uh, impartiality and come to some conclusions as to what might have caused uh, Columbia to break up in flight over Texas, hurtling along at Mach 18, we now know, 200,000 feet. Um, Bill Reedy saying, I, I can assure you we will find the cause, fix it, and we will move on. Um, it was almost three years from the Challenger explosion to the return to flight, Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, just to put that in perspective for you, two years and, and a healthy dose of a third uh, before NASA flew again. And uh, these kinds of things, depending on uh, what it is determined it is, uh, do take that long before NASA uh, and the country, for that matter, can feel comfortable uh, with moving ahead with uh, piloted space flight. The 113th mission of the space shuttle fleet and the second now to end in catastrophe, this time at the end of the mission, not uh, immediately after launch. We are going to hear uh, additional technical information, 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and I don't know who exactly is gonna be participating in that news conference, but we will, of course, bring you that. That's coming up an hour and a half from now. We've had an opportunity to um, isolate for you uh, the precise moment when Mission Control first had a sense that there was a problem, the communication loss, the loss of data, so-called telemetry on those computer screens. Uh, if we have that ready to go, uh, let's, let's listen in at the, to that moment, and you can see um, how the conversation played out. Columbia continuing uh, toward Florida, now approaching the New Mexico-Texas border, altitude. 40 miles, speed 13,200 miles per hour, range to touchdown 1,400 miles, the shuttle in the left bank with wings angled about uh, 57 degrees to horizontal. You're listening, by the way, to James Hartsfield, public affairs officer. And Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages, and we did not copy your last. Roger. That's it. Roger, and then uh, mid-communication, nothing. Let's wait a mo another moment here. Tire pressure, tire pressure will obviously be something we'll be looking at. Um, space shuttle um, tires are under tremendous high pressure. Uh, they're uh, filled with uh, nitrogen and inert gas. Um, that might be one area where people, they will be exploring. As we've been telling you, one of the keys for those people in mission control and all of this is preservation of the data. Uh, the moment something like this happens, they, they're supposed to capture what exists on their screens, uh, gather any notes, any notes, uh, anything on paper, put it all together, box it up, and, and put it in a place where it can be 
ultimately viewed by those who will be leading this investigation. That, that process still continues at Mission Control in Houston. Matter of fact, we have a live picture there of Mission Control. You can see that they're still at their consoles there, uh, long now after uh, the loss of the space shuttle Columbia. Jerry Leninger, uh, I hope you had an opportunity to hear Sean O'Keefe and Bill Reedy. Did you not? Uh, yes, I did. And, uh, you know, Bill's a good guy, and yeah, I'm sure everyone's doing everything they can. Yeah, uh, th th that point about uh, finding it, uh, fixing it, and moving on. Uh, can you, in, in this dark, dark moment, can you offer some us uh, some insurance that that is, in fact, going to happen? Well, I, I think based on the people that I worked with at NASA and the whole organization, the professionalism that they show, um, you know, we got other people who are going to follow in their footsteps, and, and you don't want to repeat uh, a day like today. And so I, I have 100% assurance in my heart that uh, people are going to look at it as hard as they can and really try to get to the root of what caused this tragedy today. Tire pressure indications. What, what are we, if I just should, we make any, should we do anything? Uh, should we make anything of that, do you think? You know, I think any abnormality that was, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the tile or uh, an object hitting possibly the orbiter during launch, they're going to look through every part of that mission, any uh, indication that there was some kind of problem. Uh, tire pressure sounds like a, a minor thing, but uh, perhaps not. I mean, the tires are protected, obviously, during re-entry. Uh, and if the tire pressure is increasing, you know, uh, heat expands things. And so if that was the case, uh, possibly there was a, a problem in that critical area. Um, you know, well, you look the, at all the data, you look at anything slightly off, and you try to make sense of it. If those tires were heated up, they exploded, certainly that would uh, take the doors off and uh, expose the um, underbody of the shuttle, which, of course, it would be extremely vulnerable at that point. Hydraulic lines going through there, that sort of thing. That's correct, Miles. So again, if uh, when you're trying to piece this thing together, you'll look at any abnormality, uh, try to put the whole picture together, look at the debris. Um, unfortunately, the debris, of course, is going to have re-entered itself, so you're going to have a lot of molten metal, and it's going to be very hard uh, to put those pieces back together. But you try to piece it together, and then you try to come up with what caused the problem. And as Bill Reedy just said, you fix it and you press on. Let's uh, talk for a moment, uh, go back to the beginning of the mission, and um, this piece that uh, apparently fell off, uh, the external tank, whether it was a piece of ice or a piece of foam, maybe a little bit of both. I don't know if we still have that tape in the, in the gate ready for air, but uh, we can talk about it nonetheless. What happened was there was a piece that fell and struck the left wing. Um, what, um, without getting uh, too far down the road here as well, uh, that obviously is an area that will be looked at. The, the, they knew about it shortly after launch, looked at that, and determined uh, after some excruciating uh, analysis that there wasn't a great deal of concern, as best I could discern. I, I know you weren't plugged into the engineering analysis of that, but uh, this is, in general, a big area of concern at NASA. Sure. Uh, you know, if you ever, you've been to the pad, I know, Miles, but a lot of people don't appreciate the fact just the sound wave bouncing off the ground and back up can, can shake the shuttle and damage things. And so there's a flush of water, literally a, a flood of water that goes on underneath the launch pad, not to dissipate the heat, but to absorb some of the sound because all that sound waves come back could shake the shuttle. Uh, ice forming on the external tank has been a problem in the past. That breaks loose during the flight. Uh, during liftoff. So all those things are looked at very carefully. Um, the good news on that, I guess, is that they have some cameras positioned down there, very good cameras that are looking very closely. And again, the analysis 16 days ago was that it looks like it didn't do anything that's of concern. Um, bottom of the shuttle, you can't afford to lose a tile or two. Um, it depends on the, the area. Uh, but you can get back in even with some tiles off if it's not in a critical area. So. You know, you look at it, but I'm sure they're going to re-examine that and look even harder now at that whole situation. Right. Jerry, uh, I would appreciate it if you could sit still for us for just a little bit, stay close. Uh, we're joined here in Atlanta by Randy Avera, who uh, was uh, an engineer with the shuttle program uh, in the dark days of the Challenger era. Um, Mr. Avera, good to have you with us. Good to be here, Miles. 
Uh, take us back to those days, the investigation, the, um, the way the investigation was conducted, and try to relate that to what's happening right now. Well, we were always working very hard to provide the most perfect orbiter and space shuttle vehicle for launch. Uh, a tremendous amount of test and checkout is involved, and of course, training and crew readiness. And uh, on the day of the crash, as today, everyone was very disappointed, very shocked and grieved. And you have to pick up your spirits and do the work. As uh, John Young, one of the astronauts, the commander of the first mission, has always said, just do your job. And it's time now for NASA and the American people and people around the world that support space exploration to do our jobs. There's going to be a lot of forensic science that's going to be required to do a thorough investigation of this particular accident. And the, the Space Shuttle Orbiter is a very complex design of electrical, software, mechanical systems and structures and flight dynamics that are similar to the X-15 uh, experimental aircraft that flew during the 1960s. Of course, so, one, one key difference with the X-15 is the X-15's body itself was designed to sort of shed its heat. Uh, this, uh, the shuttle has those tiles, and that's a di little different system, isn't it? It's a, a quite complex and integrated system. There are about five different types of insulators, uh, high temperature, m medium temperature, and low temperature uh, capabilities of insulation. Uh, a breach of any of those insulators can cause immediate damage to the substrate or structure below that, and that would directly affect the margins of safety of the structure and the flight loads that are applied and what the stresses on the vehicle are, but it's important to realize that NASA has already executed a plan to look at the evidence, document the facts, bring in the laboratories and scientific equipment to do a thorough analysis to know exactly what the facts are. Speculation is the first step in being inaccurate. And we learned back in the very first days of the Challenger crash investigation that what we thought had happened with the main engines of the shuttle, the cryogenic hydrogen oxygen engines in the rear of the orbiter, in fact, were not the problem. And we also had wrong uh, impressions about the fate of the crew as far as the crew module flight dynamics in a ballistic trajectory and whether or not the crew was alive or had an opportunity if they had the proper equipment to do an ejection or bailout. What do you think, um, we've said this earlier and it should be pointed out, there, there are no, there's no ejection system on the space shuttle. Uh, that was uh, ruled impractical and too expensive early on in the program. Uh, there, there is a bailout technique which the crew performs and practices frequently in the course of their training, but in this case that was not an option, was it? You're correct, Miles. Uh, in the first early flights, five or six flights of Columbia, there were two ejection seats and the flight crews were limited to two astronaut pilots. Those were seats that are similar to the SR-71 Blackbird ejection seats. Those were decommissioned when the shuttle was deemed operational. And currently what we have is a system that as a NASA engineer I had worked on at Kennedy Space Center, the barber pole bailout system, but that system is really only good for orbiter flight modes where the wings are level and the airspeed is under 200 knots, uh, under 250 knots. And that's for uh, blowing the side hatch off of the orbiter crew module, uh, deploying the telescoping barber pole and then doing a one at a time sequential bailout with parachutes on their backs of the crew. But at these very high altitudes and very high Mach numbers of Mach 18 at 12,000 feet, that's not practical or even reasonable. And the pole is there to keep them simply, the person bailing out from striking the leading edge of the wing, we should point out to our viewers, that's why they slide down the pole. But this, as we say, not an option here. Uh, Randy, if you could just walk us through quickly uh, sort of in areas of, in your mind, a priority, if you were conducting this investigation, where you'd start looking first down, down the list of priorities? Well, the first step is to secure the data in the centers of uh, NASA centers around the country. That data is very important. Uh, paperwork, uh, digital data that could be recorded. Uh, also to secure the crash site and to have no contamination whatsoever of that crash site. Uh, weather could play a factor. We had the Atlantic Ocean, the salt water of the ocean and the currents, 
uh, dealing with debris on the surface of the Gulf Stream headed northbound and other debris that was down on the bottom of the ocean floor. So all of this apparently being on the landmass in Texas is important to have weather conditions that are tolerable, but to do a, an immediate preservation of this evidence and to collect it in a professional and accurate way. Documentation is everything and tracking of the, of the samples that will go to many labs for chemical and uh, mechanical and structural analysis is extremely important. Randy Avera, former NASA engineer, we'd like you to stay close if you could as well. Uh, we would appreciate that. We appreciate having your expertise here. Let's, um, let's get a recap for folks who maybe just be dipping into the story. Let's take it over to uh, Darren Kagan. Darren? Yeah, Miles, we're going to handle this in two ways. Of course, this is a developing story. We're going to keep moving it forward, but we do realize that there are people who are tuning in as we go, and so we do want to recap so that you know the exact amount of information we know up to this point involving the Space Shuttle Columbia. We begin with NASA's oldest shuttle. It broke up this morning as it descended over Central Texas. The shuttle was on its way toward a planned landing at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We have video to show you. It's from our affiliate WFAA in Dallas. It will show you multiple vapor trails as the shuttle was breaking up. Now, as you're watching this, the altitude was just over 200,000 feet. Seven astronauts on board. They included six Americans and the first Israeli ever in space, payload specialist Ilan Ramon. Debris fell over a very wide area from near the Dallas area to the Texas-Louisiana border. People as far east as Shreveport, Louisiana reported seeing and feeling an explosion as the shuttle broke apart. NASA is setting up an independent board trying to determine exactly what happened. This is indeed a tragic day for the NASA family, for the families of the astronauts who flew on STS-107, and likewise tragic for the nation. That from a news conference you uh, saw live if you were with us in the last hour here on CNN, the first one that NASA has put out. They are saying another one about 3 p.m. Eastern where they will take questions. Of course, you're going to see that live right here on CNN. As we mentioned, Columbia, the oldest in the shuttle fleet, first launched back in 1981. It was on its 28th mission. We are covering this story all across the world from Israel here to the states and across the states. And Judy Woodruff is in Washington, D.C. with more. Judy. Thanks, Darren. Uh, we are keeping uh, an eye on the story here very much here in Washington. With me uh, in the studio is uh, uh, CNN's Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us. And Patty, you've got a little more information about what the Federal Aviation Administration is doing to collect and preserve the debris. Uh, that is scattered over several states. Well, what the Federal Aviation Administration has done is it's uh, put in effect a temporary flight restriction over Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, what it has done is a, anything within a 60 mile radius of Fort Polk, Louisiana, uh, and below 3,000 feet, no planes allowed in that area. FAA trying to keep planes out of the way of, of anybody who may be involved in a recovery effort there for debris, trying to protect that uh, debris and, and let those, uh, re those, those teams do their work and not have anybody get in the way. Also, uh, we're told that Homeland Security Chief Tom Ridge has designated the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as the lead agency to coordinate response and recovery of debris. Now, Ridge has called officials uh, in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, warning them about possible debris and uh, uh, trying to make sure that they preserve that debris uh, so that this investigation uh, can take place and they can piece together just what happened here. Patty, it's our understanding that uh, Tom Ridge has been contacting uh, uh, the governors. Uh, you mentioned Arizona, New Mexico. He's obviously also been in contact in Texas where it's assumed the flight broke up. Uh, Oklahoma, as well as Louisiana, where you mentioned the, uh, uh, there's an effort now to, to restrict the airspace. We've also seen news reports of people in Arkansas who saw an explosion and presumably may see debris. So we, we are talking potentially uh, four or five states involved here. We're talking here. Yeah, a huge debris field. This uh, shuttle appears to have broken up at about 200,000 feet in the air. Now, if you consider uh, how, fl how far up a, a, a normal commercial aircraft normally flies, 35 to 40,000 feet, uh, would have a wide debris field. Imagine how wide at 200,000 feet in the air uh, these pieces would be flying. So it definitely will be a multi-state effort. 
No question about it. Patty Davis, who covers aviation for us, and Patty mentioned Tom Ridge, the new director, uh, new secretary of the new department, first secretary of the new Department of Homeland Security. Of course, so much of his attention has been focused on keeping the country safe in the aftermath of 9-11. Now, of course, he's dealing with a very different uh, kind of tragedy, but one that will require all of his attention as well. You can imagine uh, this happening on a Saturday morning here in Washington. This is a city tourists always flock to. One of the most, if not the most popular museum in Washington is the Air and Space Museum, part of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, there with us uh, on the scene is our own Bob Frank. And Bob, and I assume you've been talking to tourists and others who uh, uh, have to be as deeply affected by this as we are. If not more, uh, these were people who uh, were coming to the Air and Space Museum. This is one of the most popular exhibits, of course. It is the Columbia Shuttle exhibit. You can see in back of me the NASA feed. You can see the replica of the shuttle in back of me, and you can see pockets of people. As the briefing was going on, there was this somber, very sad look, and of course we still have other people here who have been um, uh, coming here to visit, almost like they're coming to a shrine. And among them have been people from Israel Israel. Your name, sir? Ziv. Z-I-V. Ziv. And, and, tell me, and tell me how you must feel. That's a great loss. It's a tragedy. Um, as an Israeli, I mourn and grieve with the families and the friends of the crew that was lost, of course, with the Israeli and American people. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad day, but I hope in the future it'll, it'll have a more successful ending than this one. Your country was celebrating because of the inclusion of this aspect. That is true. I, everybody was very excited back at home, and this was a very bad ending for a, what could have been a great day. And among those who are here are uh, many young people. Uh, one of the ambitions always has been to be an astronaut. Uh, well, how do you feel? I think that it's a terrible loss, and I just pray for the astronauts' families that that, it's, that they should just, it's just a loss. And I just pray that they just be happy for him. <laughs> just be happy. And here's your, here's your mom. How did you tell him this morning? Well, actually, we heard about it. Um, we were at Arlington Cemetery here, and we watched it on the news, and then we were headed over here anyway. So, um, like you said, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, um, so many few people take for granted. We just all of a sudden think, oh, another shuttle's gone up in the air. It's something that we just take for granted anymore, and it's not, it's not something to take for granted at all. Had your son ever expressed the desire to be an astronaut? It's almost every child's dream. Well, they all say that at some time, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, we had a great loss today. But uh, we need to learn from this and move forward. I believe. Thank you very much. What you're hearing, of course, is a very typical of the reaction you will get here. A reaction that you will get around the country, reaction around the world. Uh, here in Washington, of course, Judy, people have a place to come to, to express that reaction. What amounts to, as I said, a bit of a shrine to the tragedy that occurred earlier this morning. Judy? All right, Bob Franken at the Air and Space Museum here in Washington. And, Bob, we have just learned that President Bush will address the nation uh, from the White House, from the Cabinet Room, uh, in just a few minutes. It's about three minutes before 2 Eastern time, we're told. The President will speak to the nation at 2 o'clock. Let's bring in our White House correspondent, Suzanne Malveaux, who's been at her post all morning. Suzanne, I know they've been uh, planning, making plans, but just now they've made the big announcement. Well, absolutely. We saw a couple of hours ago President Bush, who arrived back here at the White House, returning from Camp David, cutting that trip short. Uh, we saw him enter the residence and then on to the Oval Office with his chief of staff, Andy Card. We were told that he was notified of this tragedy. Uh, shortly after it happened in that 1030, he spoke with the director of NASA about the details of all of this. He uh, came back to the White House to better monitor the situation. Uh, Judy, as you know, the White House, um, the, the flag here lowered at half staff just a few hours ago, a very uh, symbolic of the, the tragedy here, recognizing that tragedy. Uh, as you may recall, this is really a time for, for comfort, to comfort the nation as well as to inform, uh, to mourn the lost. Uh, when, uh, when it was uh, January 28th, uh, 1986, when uh, President Ronald Reagan had this uh, very sad duty, he went just hours after the Challenger had exploded, and he said, I want to read this line to you. This is the last line that he delivered in his speech to the nation saying, we will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth 
to touch the face of God. Uh, clearly, this is a very important moment for the president, uh, a need to confront, to comfort the nation, and also to talk about the sense of bravery, um, the, the sense of dedication that these people had aboard the shuttle. We have also learned that the president has spoken with Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon. Uh, as you know, one of those aboard the shuttle was an Israeli citizen, uh, giving his condolences, passing that along to Israel as well. Judy? Suzanne, you're, you are absolutely right. This is one of the most important uh, uh, jobs, uh, functions that a president can perform. Uh, not only is the president the leader of the country, the one who is the uh, making uh, decisions uh, day in and day out, but the president must be the uh, consoler in chief at a time like this, a time of great loss, of great tragedy. And you do remind us of uh, the role that President Reagan played in 1986. The nation shocked because at that time it was the first space accident in uh, something like 20 years. America was, was uh, completely uh, rocked back on its heels by the, by the idea uh, that there would be astronauts lost in space. And I remember because I was covering, uh, covering the Challenger explosion then, I was working for the public broadcasting system for PBS, and uh, President Reagan's remarks played an enormous role in holding the country and bringing the country together. And uh, the line that you, uh, that you quoted, uh, slipping the surly bonds of earth, is one that I think all of us remember. I have every reason to believe that uh, President Bush uh, and the people around him remember that and are acutely aware of the important role that the president plays at a time like this. Again, it is just after 2 o'clock Eastern Time. We are expecting any moment to hear from President Bush, he will be addressing the nation from the cabinet room there in the White House. Suzanne, when this happened, the president was at Camp David uh, planning to spend the weekend there after a very difficult week dealing with uh, Iraq. Absolutely, Judy. This is really a pivotal weekend for the president. As you know, Secretary of State Colin Powell to go before the United Nations Security Council on Wednesday to present the case against Saddam Hussein, additional evidence. This administration, under a great deal of pressure from some U.S. allies who want to see more information, more evidence uh, to, that would justify the possibility of using military action against Saddam Hussein, already the president really having quite a full plate this weekend. I should also mention as well, Judy, just kind of a sign of the times, uh, one of the assumptions that so many people made when they first saw that this uh, shuttle was missing, that they had lost contact, was uh, terrorism. That was something that people were thinking about. In 1986, that was not necessarily the first thought on everyone's mind. Uh, clearly, this White House, as well as many people, aware of the possibilities of the danger, but senior administration officials telling us there is no indication that that was the cause of this tragedy today. Judy. All right, Suzanne, as we said, we are waiting for President Bush to speak to the nation from the White House, from the Cabinet Room. And uh, again, as we wait uh, for his remarks, uh, my colleague Miles O'Brien, who's been with us all morning. Miles, I, even at this moment, I have a sense that, uh, you know, there was an enormous reluctance in 1986 when the Challenger exploded. Uh, for people, nobody even wanted to think about going back into space again at that point. But you do have the sense now that Americans have somehow, as horrible as this is, we have come, somehow come to, uh, to the realization that space flight is dangerous. We will lose people from time to time. No one is saying we won't go into space again. Well, let's remember who was aboard Challenger. Krista McAuliffe, civilian, teacher, that, that launch, that tragedy was witnessed by school children all across this country. It was devastating for so many people and particularly for children. And there was a certain poignance to that, uh, which made it a little more difficult, I think, for people to, to uh, handle. Uh, the sense of a, of a civilian on board that shuttle not fully appreciating the risks, in this case, a crew completely made up of test pilot types, engineers, career astronauts who fully understand the risk. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Perhaps the fact that school children the world over were not necessarily witnessing what we just saw this morning. Perhaps that changes things. Um, as we look at Mission Control Houston, this is a remarkable scene here. You're seeing the good people of NASA whose job it is to watch a space shuttle while it is in orbit from those consoles. Every last little technical item on a shuttle 
has a readout on a screen down here so that they know precisely what is going on at any given moment. Someone asked me earlier, is there a black box on the shuttle? That room is the black box. There is a constant stream of data to that room, giving them a full sense of what's happening to every last piece, every last system of a space shuttle. Right now, that team, which has spent the better part of the morning collecting its data, gathering up its data in order to prepare for an investigation, is now ready for what we are ready for, which is the President of the United States, who has returned to the White House, will be addressing those good folks at NASA who work so hard to make space travel, uh, while risky, a reasonable thing to do, and the rest of the nation. Let's listen to the President. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. At 9 o'clock this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. On board was a crew of seven, Colonel Rick Husband, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Anderson, Commander Laurel Clark, Captain David Brown, Commander William McCool, Dr. Kulpna Shavla, and Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. These men and women assumed great risk in the service